Last October, a number of friends helped to plant 70,000 bulbs in the lawn. In one section, we removed the sod, hand cast the bulbs, covered with a compost topsoil mix, and then seeded with native grasses and hand planted a number of native flowers. In a separate section, we used a bulb planting machine, compliments of Bill Miller and the plant science department at Cornell University. Originally, we had planned to plant the bulbs in three areas of the lawn. But given that one of the areas was sloped, the bulb tractor wouldn't be able to do the job. So this year, we decided we would take it upon ourselves to plant another 10,000 bulbs by hand in that section. This is quite a tall task, but luckily our other two partners, Joey and Kia, finally touched down stateside and were able to help out. Planting bulbs in lawn was an idea that we were flirting with early on. None of us particularly liked the over manicured look of the standard American lawn, which is typically a pretty sterile environment for insects and other wildlife. Instead, we were looking to create more habitat for pollinators and create an artistic floral tapestry emanating from the common house and leading to the memorial garden. In the Netherlands, which is where Sander is from, this type of planting is called Stinzen style, but traditionally they would plant only one type of bulb in the lawn. Instead, we're opting for around a dozen different types, which bloom consecutively for over three months, typically from March through the first week of June. The bulbs are fairly low to the ground and will naturalize slowly, so they work well with shorter grasses. And we're experimenting with a custom native lawn mix in one of the areas, which we had featured already on this channel, and then planting in some native flowers as well to attract our native specialist pollinators. This coming spring will be interesting because we'll have planted each of the sections of lawns using three different techniques. So I think this is probably gonna be one of our last days of doing some bulb planting. I do have some more bulbs coming in that are different from these bulbs that will also go into the new bulb lawn, but they're not in yet. So we had some delays, I, I suppose, but you could see that there is like a mix of bulbs here. We're planting about a dozen different types of bulbs in the lawn, but there's, I would say maybe eight or nine here and we're aiming to plant about 10,000 in the lawn. So we're doing it by hand. So we're using like a power planter, which is on a drill and we're using a hori hori knife. So I'll show you these. These are the Fritillaria meleagris, which are the cobra head lilies. And I think these are really beautiful. Some of them are like a white checkered kind of look. Others are a more like maroon colored I think they're sometimes called checkered lilies as well. And then this one is Aranthus. So Aranthus are some of the earliest bloomers. They have like this little yellow flower that emerges pretty early on. We didn't have as many Aranthus um, emerge this past year because the snow just kept on going in and out. It was like a very erratic snowy year. And then this is Galanthus. So Galanthus are also called like snowdrops and they're quite a, a tiny bulb as well. They look like almost like little tulip bulbs. The one that I already um, planted all of and I'm not gonna get it until again a little later is Tulipa sylvestris. And they turned out to be some of my favorites. So they kind of look like this shape, but the coat on the, on the bulb is a bit more of like a reddish brown color, like a ruddy color, and they're slightly bigger than this. Then we have these crocuses. So this is Crocus Tomasianus white wall purple. So it's a, it's a, not a species crocus, but these are quite tiny and they're also some of the earliest bloomers. So you could compare it in size to the uh, Fritillaria right here and you could see how small they are. And then this one emerges much later. So this one was like in the May, June, and this is more like March, April. These are anemones. And they kind of are a little flatter shaped. They uh, are a darker color and they 
uh, get this nice daisy-like look to them. They have like a, the, the ray florets and they have little disc florets in the middle. And these are kind of like a bluish purple, like lavender shade. And then we have a lot of these. I think these are the, yeah, muscari, much larger. So these are called uh, grape hyacinths. They're not related to the hyacinths, but uh, they have this like little tower of, of grapes and the bees absolutely adore them. These are all great generalist pollinator plants. Um, honeybees and bumblebees um, really gravitate towards this one. And I think that, you know, they have to get up into the little cups of the, of the muscari in order to be able to get to the pollen and nectar sources. This is the last one I'll show you. This is Corrigulus Beth Evans. So this is a cultivar of Corrigulus. And you can see they are a little flatter than some of the other ones. And this one is like a pinkish color. So this is the only one that is a little off the color uh, palette of what we were going for. So it's mainly um, purples, blues, yellows, and whites. Um, so these are the, the main plants that we're going to be planting in. Let me see if I, I think I have one more, hold on. It's buried under here somewhere. So you can see the, this one was the Tulipa sylvestris. So we already went through all of those. But like I said, I'm gonna get more of those because I, I actually surprised myself. I really liked those. This is Galanthus. I think I already, I think I showed this one. Yeah, this is the, uh, the snowdrops. I already showed that one. And then what about this one? Oh, Chianodoxa. Chianodoxa is pretty small. These ones kind of remind me of the anemones as well. This is called Glory of the Snow. And if you kind of think about the common names, like these are the ones that come up during the snow. So the ones that really peek their heads out of the snow are the snowdrops, um, the Glory of the Snow, Aranthus, uh, and the crocuses. Those are some of the earliest ones. So we'll see how these emerge because we're literally creating these bowl blondes and we, we put them in very differently. This bowl blonde that we're doing, which is on the slope, is uh, could not, we could not do it with the tractor that we had in the middle of the bulb lawn, which we use the tractor to put the bulbs under. And then the other one, we removed the sod completely, folded the bulbs under, and then reseeded the whole grass. So over time, we'll see how each of these different techniques compare. Um, but uh, this coming spring will be like the first real spring that they've had like a full year to be under the ground. So it'll be interesting to see how they emerge. But we got our baskets and we'll be planting them up today. It's been about four days of bulb planting now, and I think we're about halfway there because I started on this end this morning, and we have this like wide swath area, so we have to like make sure that we have enough bulbs that go throughout this. But luckily, Joey and Kia are here helping out, which is like, <laughs> which is so good because honestly, we had a lot of help with the other two bulb lawns and this one is gonna be all by hand. So we're folding the bulbs under with like a hori hori knife, which jo Joey said he's been hurting his hand with. <laughs> and then we also have like the power planter on the drill, which is also pretty useful, but it's much more analog compared to how we actually did the bulbs in those two lawns behind there. That's what we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna to be putting about 10,000 bulbs in this lawn. In regards to like spreading it out evenly, we're just kind of eyeballing it. This is gonna be much more hands-on than compared to like the bulb tractor that we did last year, which basically like made a slice through the lawn and literally just like drop bulbs at a certain rate. So hopefully this is gonna look a, a, a bit more naturalistic because we are doing it by hand. And I started to separate it into like thirds. So I had put in probably like 
2,000 plus bulbs like in this part of the lawn. What I did see is that maybe I, I put them in a little bit too surficially at first because some of the area had been dug up, I think by squirrels. Um, I don't think you could see that very well now, but um, these little holes in here, uh, that's where I had put some bulbs. And then we started to smarten up and we said, you know, let's, uh, if we knock out too much soil, let's actually put some compost topsoil on top of it. So that's what we have here. We started to kind of like plug it. And so this looks a little unsightly, but as far as spring goes, you won't even see any of that soil next spring as the grass starts to grow. So we basically cut this down, uh, I don't know, like maybe a, a week or two weeks ago. And I had to run the mower over it a couple times just to get it low enough because we, we let the grass grow pretty high, as you could see. And we only mow it like twice a year. But in order to put the bulbs in, it's much easier if the lawn is mowed and you want to actually have it mowed pretty low to the ground before spring hits because that's when the bulbs emerge and you don't want them lost in the grass. So all of these lawns will have to actually mow before winter. So that's probably within like the next few weeks because we'll probably be under snow um, any day now. So we gotta, we gotta get on that. Oh no, quick, yeah, get back to work, the camera's on. <laughs> <laughs> so what basically Joey's doing is he's putting holes in the ground around three to four inches deep because a lot of these bulbs are quite small. And typically when you put bulbs in, you want, you want the holes to be about two to three times the length of the bulb. You can put them in a little bit deeper. It doesn't necessarily benefit them, but it would benefit them to go a little bit deeper if you have like squirrels or other animals that will tend to dig up the bulbs. Now, not all of these bulbs are edible, but you know, I think they tend to favor like tulip bulbs and things along those lines. And so now what we're doing is once the holes are dug, Kia is putting in somewhere between two, three, four bulbs, just to make it easier for ourselves. And usually we try to pick like a few different types of bulbs that will go into a hole. And that, you know, that saves on, you know, making too many holes in the lawn and uh, saves Joey's wrists, <laughs> saves my wrists, and uh, allows us to actually like make it a little bit dense throughout. So. Because these bulbs are all different, they tend to emerge at different times of the year. So even if you're putting like three different types of bulbs into a hole, some of those might not actually be simultaneous bloomers. They might actually bloom over the course of like several months. So this lawn had no bulbs. Those two lawns did. So this coming spring, hopefully these will like completely emerge and we'll see what it looks like because I think that this, this lawn was sorely lacking in bulbs and that was our original plan was to actually do this as a bulb lawn too. So that's what we're doing uh, today and basically this week. You'll have to stay tuned for updates on this bulb lawn and the others this coming spring. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this film and the others that we put out, give them a thumbs up and consider subscribing, hitting the notifications bell, and even tipping. Your viewership and support truly does matter. 10% of our Google AdSense revenue is reinvested back into projects here in the Finger Lakes community, which is matched by our partners over at Espoma Organic, so it really does make a difference. And I want to extend a special thank you to flowerbulbs.com, which have helped assist in our 80,000 bulb lawn and is a valuable source for inspiration and education. Thank you, and we'll see you in the next video.